the the reason we kind of uh, started topic was it's a problem that we faced in our previous company. <laughs> we grew our company with content and SEO as the backbone. And writing content is extremely difficult, especially when you bring on new hires, kind of having them follow the same process that you've been following is extremely difficult. So after we sold the company, we were kind of looking for ideas in the space. And one of the things that was kind of uh, taking off was uh, using uh, NLP or AI in SEO. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of led to the inception of Topic. Um, so Topic, in a nutshell, it helps you write and optimize um, uh, high quality SEO content. Boom, boosh, boom, 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 What's boom, up, everybody? Boom, You're boom, listening to the boom, Hustle and Flow boom, Chart boom, Podcast boom, boom, with your boys, Matt Wolf boom, boom, and Joe Fear. Boom, boom, wiki, Check wiki, wiki. It. Welcome back to the Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast. I am your host, Matt Wolf, and I'm here with. <clears throat> I'm clear my throat. <laughs> I hit the record button chug. right while Joe was in the middle of chugging water Hello, just to is, make it awkward. My name is Joseph Fear. How hey, are you? I'm I'm great. Hey, yeah, me too. Great. Artificial intelligence. What are your thoughts? Oh, it's scary. I don't know, man. SEO thoughts taking over the world. <laughs> SEO is taking over the world. <laughs> in ways you don't know. Yes. No. I'm back. <laughs> I was caught off guard by Matt's uh, his introduction here. Or his, uh, yes, you SEO. You'd be used to that kind of thing by now. <laughs> you wait to the most awkward times to hit the recording button. No, literally, it was like, okay, let me just like, oh, he's about to drink and go. Yep. <laughs> so carrying on AI, my thoughts. Yeah. Well, you'll hear them in this episode. <laughs> That's why <laughs> Such you hit a cop out. <laughs> <laughs> and you also hear a couple other guys, uh, their their perspectives as well. Yeah. So yep. today we've got Nick and Rio on the show. They are the co-founders and operators over at usetopic.com, which is a really cool SEO tool mm -hmm. that uh, we've started using along with Ahrefs, which we'll talk about in a minute. But um, I think it's just called Topic, right? Yeah, it's Topic, but the URL for their site is Use Topic. Cool. Just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, so <laughs> their, their, their company's called Topic. Yes. You can get access to the tool at usetopic.com. Nick and Rio, uh, two, two dudes that I found so damn fascinating. Yeah, both um, engineers. So both they have engineers. that sort of engineer anal analyzing brain, right? Yeah, that's how they're coming across. That, well, that's exactly... I'm thinking of just how... How people approach problems, I think, is super fascinating. They approach things like software and marketing and all of these things in a totally different fashion than we would think. Mm -hmm. You know, or how like a lot of digital marketers or direct response folks would think. So I thought that was cool. Yeah, you know, you got you have these two engineers that uh, come from a very startup culture. You know, tech crunch, mm -hmm. and like we're actually talking offline right after this. That like we're actually attending a tech crunch event right now virtually. Yeah. Yep. We're actually in a booth with Unicorn Equity. Mm -hmm. So, hey, shout out. Mm. So, but uh, I, I just thought it was cool. So, we're getting their perspective on how to use AI mm. and SEO and how, how that impacts your content in business, really, too. So, fascinating episode. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about, um, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence. So, we're going to talk about how artificial intelligence is affecting writing content, how mm -hmm. artificial intelligence is affecting SEO. Um, Joe goes off on some tangents about how they're getting into our brains. No, uh, we're gonna it's just connecting to the concept. Of the <laughs> no, I know. I'm just messing with you. Um, but uh, uh, we're, we talk about their partnership and the dynamic of how the two work together as partners because it's yes. always fascinating as partners ourselves. So wide ranging conversation, but mostly focused around SEO, AI, and content marketing. Right. I would say that sums it up well, my friend. That sums it up well. Yeah, okay. that's and I learned something. I didn't know that Elon has Open AI. Yeah, and it's basically regulation of ai yeah well it's a open source ai so like anybody could governing sort of body for ai yeah that's scary yeah that is a little crazy <laughs> anyway <laughs> grab the that. notes on this episode because there's some there's some dense stuff that we talk about in this and you're going to want that's the true. notes um so go you can get those over at hustle and com slash comp that is hustle and com slash comp you got two weeks to get them otherwise they mm -hmm. get pulled down only the latest two weeks worth of episodes are available in free note form that's correct. That is correct. I would uh, I would agree with that statement. So get the notes. Um, all right. So Ahrefs, they're Ahrefs. back. They are friends, and actually, they are friends of Nick and Ryu as yes. well. Use topic the tool we're to topic the tool we're talking about Top today. Out. Well, <laughs> if I repeat, use topic, people remember to go to use topic, right? Um, so the tool we're talking about today, topic, is an SEO tool. Ahrefs is an SEO tool, but you can use them in unison. They do not compete with each other. They serve completely different functions. Um, in fact, here's Rio from 
use topic saying what he likes about Ahrefs. Yeah, I mean, I've used all the SEO uh, rank tracking tools, and Ahrefs is definitely the one that has the cleanest UI, shows the data in the best way. We recommend it to all of our customers. Yeah, that's awesome. And and yeah, so you could use it with with Topic and Ahrefs. They kind of blend together nicely. And in this episode, we'll probably talk a lot more about that. <laughs> so you heard it from the boy. You heard it from them, and they got a seven dollar seven day trial. You got to go grab Ahrefs. Um, it's an amazing tool. We use it in our in our business. They uh, they do not pay for our account. We pay for our own account. We used it long before they were a sponsor. And Joe's just making me crack it's up okay. right now. So going. <laughs> seven dollars, seven days. Go grab Ahrefs now. Let's go talk with uh, Nick and Rio. Hey, Nick and Rio, how you guys doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for having us. Of course. Hey, thanks for having us. Yeah, this is sweet having a partnership. Two partnerships chatting on the podcast. We were talking. We don't get that opportunity a lot, so I think uh, we'll have a cool chat around that. Yeah. And um, but yeah, we got connected to you guys through Jurgen over at Polymash, and then before Jurgen, it was Lisa Beyer, which I think. But I know Lisa listens to the show, so she'll hear that and probably. Um, yeah. So that's cool. I just wanted to give a shout out, but uh, you guys are just fascinating with what you're developing. Um, you know, with software and AI and. SEO and I think a lot of folks here listening are gonna is kind of just kind of like open their eyes to what's possible and what's actually happening right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a real honor to be on the show, and we're glad that we got connected. Sweet. Well, let, let's let's go back a little bit. How did you guys um, get in business together? How did this the company you guys are working on form? What what's kind of the the storyline here? Yeah. So about seven years ago, Nick and I met in the basement of a university library. Um, we were actually working on a Pinterest clone. Uh, and so at the time, that was the hot new thing in uh, Los Angeles where we went to undergrad. And, um, you know, we got seed funding, worked in Pasadena for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, we pivoted that business to be a social media aggregation business, so in marketing technology. And then we grew that to about um, 5 million in annual revenue over the course of, you know, six years. Mm. And so that's how we've really forged our relationship. That's awesome. Have you, yeah. uh, have you guys always, um, so what you started in LA at, uh, you know, at a university there, have you always worked together or has it always been remote? Like, Cause obviously right now with COVID and all that different locations, it looks like we're breaking the rules. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Uh, we actually uh, lived at one point together uh, while we were working on our previous startup. Uh, but for the last six, seven years, we've been working um, in person. Mm -hmm. uh, but prior to meeting Rio, I never worked with him. Um, but <laughs> when I started working with Rio, it was it was smooth, uh, and that's really what really kept us going for this long. Yeah, no, it's, it, partnerships are always interesting. Like, because yeah, where it starts in some way, but then you almost have to like mold and kind of figure out who does what or who's best at what or you know so how do you guys fix like explain your guy like how you guys work together i guess let's start there because dissecting the partnership and then maybe we can chat about some cool ways that we don't even know about <laughs> and share best practices yeah i think that uh we can each present our perspectives and they might be different you know? <laughs> <laughs> you'll learn a but, thing or two <laughs> yeah i mean i've always considered nick to be um you know really much more of the ideas guy. He's really creative. He's constantly thinking of new ways to approach problems. And then uh, I tend to be a little more operational, like how do we get things done? Um, and what are the next steps? But yeah, I think one thing is that we're both developers. So we do have uh, something to connect on that we both relate with and respect each other on. So there's some overlap, there's some differences. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear Nick's perspective as well. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, uh, Rio pretty much covered. I think we have, we definitely have complementary skill sets in terms of our execution. Mm -hmm. Like, I like being the idea guy, coming up with innovative ideas, and Rio is the one who kind of takes it to the finish line. Uh, so it's happy. It's nice to have someone that you can trust on to kind of execute whatever ideas you have. Um, even on the engineering side, I do a lot of uh, back-end engineering things that people don't see, hmm. and Rio works on things that people do see. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, complementary skill sets in every aspect of a relationship that really makes it work. Yeah. Now, 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 do you guys ever like butt heads at all? Or are you guys like pretty much like everything just kind of flows? You just assume that they fight all the time. No, Come I'm on. asking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's very rare, actually, uh, that we uh, we argue. But uh, when I know Rio is upset. Um, 
I take a step back and let him kind of vent out. Uh, yeah. But it's very rare that I we uh, argue on the most fundamental things. Uh, we usually argue on minor things that every co-founder relationship would, uh, you know, should do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I mean, no big problems, and that's that's what's um, <laughs> working for us. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's one of the benefits of having a longer term relationship is that with the trust, you can, you know, easily mend something like mm-hmm. a disagreement just because you know so much about the other person and what makes them tick yeah. and what, you know, what is actually going on behind the scenes behind an argument. You know, oftentimes when you don't have that trust, it just seems like the other person's being irrational or something. Mm. That's a yeah, it's yeah. a good point because once you know who the person is for that period of time, and it does take time, I feel like, or really hard experiences, maybe in a compressed amount of time, but you know, like if something's bubbling up in conversations, like you don't want to ignore that because you want to you want to talk it out. I feel like you can address that because you have that trust. It's like hold on, hold on t- slow down. Let's let's address yeah. this before it gets any bigger. Have you found because that's like a thing that we really honed in on? I'd say. Well, we've recently. gotten we've gotten good at sort of reading the room, but yeah. like reading each other. Like I could tell with non-visual verbal communication. Like, all right, he's getting upset about something. Let's figure out what's going on yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, totally. I think uh, we have a similar relationship, um, and we actually do weekly check-ins uh, okay. where we ask the the tough questions. Hey, how are you feeling? Are you optimistic about where we're going? If not, what can be changed? So these weekly check-ins uh, kind of serve us, uh, you know, it provides a formal platform for us to vent out our frustrations. Uh, that way you're not bubbling it up, you know. So mm-hmm. that was something that we implemented uh, that really is working for us. I like that concept of like uh, oh, those questions, you know, they're deeper questions than like, hey, what's what kind of projects are we working on this week? Yeah. You know, and it's like, uh, yeah, interesting. So what other... I guess explain some of the meetings or check-ins that you guys do as co-founders at, on a consistent basis. So you have a weekly check-in. Is there a little bit more to it than just what you said there? So yeah, on a, for weekly check-ins, we basically, um, so we call it an, um, a weekly goal-setting meeting uh, where one portion of the meeting is set aside for check-ins and sort of understanding how they're doing on a personal level. And then uh, we kind of dive into our weekly goals. Since there's just two of us right now running topic, uh, it's very important for us to be aligned and on our goals every week. Uh, so we do that meeting uh, every Friday or Monday, depending on uh, the day and mm-hmm. the busyness of that day. And uh, we also do like a daily stand-up uh, just mm-hmm. to kind of get our get ourselves on board on what we're working on. And occasionally, I keep hitting up with ideas throughout the day. So we keep <laughs> using Zoom to uh, kind of checking in on each other, um, especially with COVID. It's important to stay in touch. Hmm. Uh, yeah. But yeah, the, those are some of the meetings that we uh, do. Uh, but one of the things that we do is uh, for every customer call, both we and I join the call hmm. um, because mm-hmm. we both get, you know, that's that's a good way uh, to kind of keep ourselves motivated, uh, you know, and also understand our customer problems really uh, well. Yeah. Now, now, is it just the two of you or is there is there like more teams of de- developers or right now it's just the two of you guys doing everything? Yeah, it's, it's just two of us. Yeah, it's just the two of us. Nice. That's so cool. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, all right. So a couple things there. I want to hear. <laughs> the, I want to dissect what that that daily stand up sound or looks like. And then I want to go over to um, shoot, the other one was. It's going to come back to me. Let's start with the stand-up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, like, what does the daily stand-up meeting look like for, for you guys to check in with each other? Yeah, so for the daily stand-up, I mean, <clears throat> it's pretty simple. It's about um, what we've got going on and then any blockers. Uh, but really, I think it's also an opportunity to mix in some of the social time Yeah. because with COVID, you know, we don't have an opportunity to have the informal conversations that you usually would in an office so Mm -hmm. it's you know about noticing somebody's haircut like nick just got his haircut you know yesterday (laughs) i have not had a haircut in seven months so i'm jealous (laughs) i've been cutting my hair i'm like it's bearing all right so far you know sharing haircutting (laughs) tips like all sorts of uh to my wife (laughs) it's good (laughs) that makes sense yeah yeah. so i mean it's simple as because it's just crazy i know it's like simple that i asked that like what does your stand-up meeting look like but it's like just a partnership i know we don't always do that we do check in somehow daily but sometimes it just ends up being like a slack message or two but it's like him asking for something of me or me vice versa 
Yeah. You know, but I like just the, like, do you have any obstacles? Like, we all know what we're working on, or what are you working on? Mm-hmm. Anything, mm-hmm. you know, anything in your way? Oh, cool. Nothing? Sweet. Let's go. Um, I think us yeah. doing that daily would be actually really helpful. <laughs> yeah. And probably more fun, too. I feel like it's more motivating that way when you check in yeah, with each other. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's part of the daily exercise of building trust. You know, mm. Nick and I encountered that in our previous company where um, occasionally we'd have doubts where we're, I mean, um, like spans of time when we were so focused on uh, working and getting our goals done that, you know, we'd forget to check in and it would, it would uh, bubble up, you know, over the course of a couple of weeks where all that pent up energy comes out in an outburst or like a misunderstanding, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you notice that kind of thing. And I think so much of, uh, so much of the co-founder relationship um, is, is related to, you know, like another human relationship like Mm -hmm. a romantic relationship all the advice that you read about maintaining like a romantic relationship applies it's like communication checking in regularly understanding the other person Mm -hmm. super critical yeah Mm -hmm. one other thing that we do uh do in addition to us in in us doing a stand-ups is uh uh, sharing wins uh from previous days Mm -hmm. Uh, so if you have any customers signing up, uh, we usually share that win so that we set that tone for the, the entire day. Like we're going, mm. uh, we're approaching our day on a positive note. Um, so that's one thing that we, Ooh, that really that. is helping us uh, is kind of sharing the wins um, on a regular basis and celebrating them uh, just by smiling at it or just being happy about it. So It's crazy that some of these easiest things like, like start with gratitude, you know, or, you know, mindfulness mm-hmm. and you're like, there's so many of these morning routines we have for ourselves, but then mm-hmm. at business, it's like, okay, you have another relationship there or you have these goals or motives. Like why not start that with the positives and like, yeah, it could be someone in support that's like writing in and saying like, I love your podcast. It mm-hmm. helped me do X, you know, like, heck yeah. <laughs> or, you know, we've been getting, I got to shout this guy out, Brian Bennett. Yeah. Uh, he's a listener of our show and he's been sending us a dollar per day through Venmo wow. each. And he's been sending a video attached to that as well. <laughs> Basically like a personalized message each day and it got our attention. Yep. Um, but like, that's been kind of like our <laughs> daily practice lately. It was like, oh. There's a video from Brian. <laughs> That's a good way to start your day. So yeah, build that into your That's daily meetings. Super smart. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so before topic, did you guys you guys had another software before topic that you guys were doing together? Yeah, we had. Uh, we worked on we worked on four products total, including topic. Um, oh. uh, so we worked on. Um, Hype Marks, which was the Pinterest clone that Rio mentioned, um, mm-hmm. sort of a social bookmarking website that didn't take off. And then we used the same technology and we pivoted to uh, a product called Tint, Mm -hmm. which does social media aggregation for brands. So essentially, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, aggregating content that their users are sharing on social networks and getting legal permissions to repurpose them. So our technology enabled them to do that at scale. Mm -hmm. Um, We ran that for almost six years. um, And then, yeah, now we moved on a topic after that. Nice. Yeah, that's, man. That's uh, so interesting. So I'm kind of curious, like just the marketing with the startup, because yeah, like, we come from like a marketing forward kind of industry, and I'm always fascinated by like how does uh you know a software company you know with a whole different perspective, I guess, way of marketing themselves grow into like a substantial. You said five million, right? It was mm-hmm. okay. So like, what was like one or two of the key marketing factors that led you to that kind of growth? Yeah, I think one of the key things that was really the turning point for us with that business was that uh, our product was an embeddable product. Mm -hmm. Um, It's basically a social media widget that people can put on their website. And so we had a freemium version of that. um, And so we basically had a powered by Tint um, Mm -hmm. logo at the bottom. And that um, we basically engineered a backlinking strategy where we would have that link to specific landing pages with targeted um, copy and use that to gain our initial traction to rank for keywords like Instagram widget or Twitter widget. Mm. And so when people were looking for the official one, they'd see ours and see that it was a superior version and choose that. Ooh. Yeah. That's, that's like chess compared <laughs> to checkers like <laughs> if you compare it to like oh just run a facebook ad to this thing it's like no you just engineered a piece of software that's a freemium it's a tool useful valuable thing 
but you engineered backlinking so your SEO strategies can be, you know, more effective and that generates money on the back end there i'm I'm assuming when they upgrade and well whatnot. as well as the viral sharing they, that too you know, yeah. because every time it goes on somebody's site you know however many people visit that site see powered by on there and a handful of those people are going to click it and go grab the free version and then they put it on their site and mm. it's like there's this sort of exponential component to it yeah absolutely i feel like it's you know there's the bread and butter of seo or content marketing advice where it's like create great content um you know guest post mm-hmm. but occasionally business will be lucky enough to have that unique little spin that they can take to take an alternate path to success um yeah and, so and that can be interesting too no it's very, you're and that's exactly kind of like the thinking that was going on in my mind is like yeah the the standard approach is write more content run more ads drive traffic go you know it's almost like this push 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 strategy but you know you're just kind of saying here <laughs> go here do something with it but you kind of know what's going to happen they're going to share it around they're going to embed it there and all of this is going to happen because of that it's like it's chess yeah. <laughs> not checkers <laughs> you know yeah so yeah, to, uh, I think that's one of the things that uh, every startup or every business to kind of uh, take a step back and see what are some levers that we can pull that can engineer our SEO growth. I mean, doing it in a traditional, uh, you know, white, uh, it's not snake oil techniques, white but hat. Yeah. You know, white hat techniques. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a good thing that every startup or every business um, kind of need to establish, uh, even though SEO is a long term play, kind of laying that foundations early on can really, uh, you know, yield results, uh, compounding results, actually. So that's one, uh, you know, tip that we would love your audience to take away is to, you know, figure out if there are any nice tech, you know, opportunities that you uh, that you can utilize to get that traction initially. Absolutely. On the SEO front. Mm-hmm. Now, can we, let, let's talk about, about topic a little bit. Can you sort of e- explain the concept? Because I think it's going to sort of set the groundwork and the context for the rest of the episode. So can you explain, you know, why you came up with Topic and and what you know what it it, it does for people and their companies? Yeah. Um, so the way the the reason we kind of uh, started Topic was it's a problem that we faced in our previous company. Mm-hmm. We grew our company with content and SEO as the backbone, and writing content is extremely difficult, especially mm-hmm. when you bring on new hires. Kind of having them follow the same process that you've been following is extremely difficult. So after we sold the company, we were kind of looking for ideas in the space. And one of the things that was kind of uh, taking off was uh, using uh, NLP or AI in SEO. Mm-hmm. And uh, that kind of led to the inception of Topic. Um, so Topic, in a nutshell, it helps you write and optimize um, uh, high quality SEO content. Um, and we do that in two ways. Uh, we help you um, create an effective outline by automating all the research involved in creating an outline. And B, once you have your first draft, we kind of highlight some gaps in your content and help you fix them so that you can publish your content with more confidence. So that's how we do it. So that's, that's what Topic does. It's so cool. And I think it was when we first heard about you guys, it was like we were saying from Jurgen, and that was with the implications to podcasts and how to use topic with podcasting. And you had some amazing strategies around those. Um, and then I think from that, then, yeah, you started using it with some of our affiliate uh, yeah. blog posts that we already had. So we ran those through topic and then what graded uh, our post. And then I don't know, you were you were doing this, Matt. So maybe... Yeah, from our so, so I, I had a blog post on a software tool that we were promoting as an affiliate. I ran it through Topic. I think it gave me like a D or something like that. <laughs> but it said, here's what um, other people that are ranking for this. Here's what topics they're they're talking about in their posts. Here's what questions they're answering. Here's keywords that are commonly found in those posts. And it gave me all of this data about now if I add this stuff to my post, then it's going to be the most comprehensive piece of content among the other ones that are ranking for that keyword. So I went and I followed all the suggestions. I got it up to like an A plus and uh, yeah, it, it, it did a great job of basically telling me this is what you need to be writing about if you want to rank for these keywords. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of the times content producers, especially if they're experts in a subject, have a hard time understanding what a newbie or their audience really wants to learn about. So it's mm. our software just helps connect the dots and exposes those things so that, you know, you talk about the right things and it applies to both podcasting and to, uh, you know, blog posts. Yeah. And that's where 
uh, you know, because we our SEO is still, I think, Matt, the number one driver of traffic, right? Mm-hmm. To, yeah. So, and it's been like that for, I feel like years now. Yeah. Um, and especially because of our podcast and us releasing two episodes a week with content, you know, a pretty big uh, show notes page, aka blog post uh, for each person and all these links. So it works out well for us. Mm-hmm. And this is just going to enhance that part of our business. Uh, but I think it was Jurgen that said, or it was one of you, I forget, but the comprehensive content uh, uh, concept and how that's so powerful or why it's so powerful right now. Can you talk about that and kind of explain what that is and why that's important right now? Yeah, absolutely. So when Google's showing <clears throat> specific results on the search results page, you know their goal is to um, get people to read the content, get value from it, and then stop searching, mm-hmm. you know, and stop clicking around. Because if they're clicking around, if they're bouncing out, that means that Google didn't show the results that satisfied the searcher. Mm-hmm. And so what they're doing to optimize their system on an ongoing continuous basis is they're measuring things like bounce rate and how long people are spending on the site in order to determine, you know, how much value is this article giving? Mm-hmm. And so the idea is that the better that you're able to add value to your audience, the longer they're going to stay on the page and the less they're going to bounce. And since those are key metrics in how Google ranks, um, that's why it's so important to create comprehensive content. Yeah. And that's that's where it's so interesting is I think you were telling me that I think on the first call we had that you can have a website with, with a pretty low domain authority. But if you're more comprehensive than this site that might be ranked a lot higher than you, you can actually kind of leapfrog because you you have everything that Google wants to present to, I guess, the highest ranked pages. Absolutely. It's, um, you know, if Google just relied on authority, there'd be, you know, it would be worse for people who are searching because you just get the same results over and over again. You know, they yeah. really want to reward yeah. the content and not just the authority. Yeah. And I noticed in topic too, it'll actually tell you inside of topic when, when you search for a specific keyword, it'll show you everything that's ranking for that keyword. And it'll actually point out the ones that are sort of punching above their weight class, so to speak, right? It'll, it'll actually show you like this has a low domain authority, but they're ranking. So maybe pay attention to this one. Yeah, those can be really interesting to look at, especially since um, oftentimes, you know, the marketers listening to the show might not be working with uh, Fortune, you know, 100 brand with a huge domain authority. And so they want to see who's, who's sneaking into the top of the SERPs and how can I be like them mm. and, and how, what can I learn from them? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, so with topic, so the way that I guess the biggest, uh, what the fastest way someone can actually implement your tool is to essentially what run some previous content they've written through, through the software, right? And then it gives some kind of results with a checklist called uh, what an outline, I think a brief, a brief. Outline. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, the best way I think the uh, uh, is to kind of optimize your existing articles. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you're going to see results pretty quickly versus creating a new piece might take a couple of weeks for Google to kind of rank it. Um, but yeah, the best way to kind of get more value out of topic very, at the very beginning, especially if you're trying to convince other stakeholders, is to optimize some of your existing content. Mm-hmm. Uh, go look for content that's actually in page two, just trying to, you know, just uh, uh, low, low-hanging fruits that has a lot of potential. And then go ahead and run it through topic cover those content gaps and then publish it. I think that's the best way to kind of Mm. uh, get value out of topic at the very beginning. Yeah. Well, and one thing, this was actually from when you guys were on Jurgen's show or uh, Rio was on Jurgen's show. Um, They were, you were talking about podcasting specifically. And I thought it was a really smart strategy of like, if you're going to bring a guest on for your, your podcast, look up the topic, you know, create a brief on the topic that that person talks about. And it'll essentially give you a cheat sheet of like, here's what to talk about on that episode. (laughs) Right. And then you can make, transcripts or notes from that and you're being comprehensive based on all of the data that google told you to uh is what people are searching for essentially and i thought that was just such a you could probably explain it better than i just did but i just thought it was such a brilliant concept yeah i thought it was absolutely clever we hadn't even thought about that use case to be honest and when jurgen came to us and he was like we could use this to plan interviews you know i was like this is smart because you've got the domain expert you know Mm-hmm. And you're basically connecting all the people, like thousands of people who are searching for that information and this expert together. And you get to be the person, you know, in between who, mm-hmm. who's um, presenting that information and curating it. So, yeah. That's a, that's a cool way to, that's a cool perspective, mm-hmm. you know, as like the curator. 
and that's exactly what we do you know yeah. and and uh, yeah and having a tool like this to help you curate more of the right people or the people looking for the thing that you're solving through the curation process it's like serving the community better by using you know something like this getting yeah more absolutely it's it's like you're doing uh you're doing google's job um by basically generating great content right yeah, yeah. now it, uh, so let's talk about ai copywriting and and like how do you define ai copywriting and how does it fit into the mix of what you guys are doing yeah so uh so ai copywriting is the concept of having ai kind of give you that first draft mm. a lot of people have the opinion that ai is going to be giving you that final draft but the way we see it is we we see AI augmenting your content production process and not replacing your writers. So the way we do that is we help, you know, there, there are avenues in the product where AI can uh, cut down that uh, ideation time or creative energy cycles that you spend mm -hmm. coming up with paragraphs. And uh, we, we envision AI sort of augmenting that process so that you have your first draft, draft and your writers are editing your content after that. Mm. So yeah. that's how we see AI copywriting. So is that something that, that might be like integrated into to topic in the future? Is that kind of like the roadmap where maybe you plug in a keyword and it would write like a rough draft? For, like what, what, what's your game plan using this information? Yeah, we recently rolled out uh, a couple of integrations uh, uh, last week. Um, so right now we are able to generate titles and descriptions mm -hmm. uh, based on uh, a keyword, mm -hmm. uh, which are pretty good. Uh, I think the next step for us is to kind of, um, I don't, we don't foresee AI to completely write an article at the current time, because I think the AI is as good as the inputs that you give it. Mm -hmm. And if you give it a really good outline, uh, and kind of organize your content and sort of give it as an input, then AI is able to kind of come up with the first draft. We haven't figured out, we are working on that um, as you know, in the next couple of months. So how does, yeah, uh, so you said the inputs and, you know, the output, it's kind of, you know, it's what you <laughs> give it. What, what would the inputs be for like writing a first draft of AI copy? Okay. Yeah, so the inputs that you'd uh, give us if you're writing a piece of AI copy with topic would be you give us the keyword that you're targeting, um, then we're going to pull up the current top results. And then what we do is we take the current top results and we feed them into the AI system. And then it outputs recommendations for titles, descriptions, different um, ideas for headings that you can include in your article. Hmm. And so... Um, Basically, like we mentioned earlier with the curation, if you're writing a blog post, you're going to be an advanced curator who's picking out, you know, out of these 10 choices, which one is really going to resonate with your audience the most um, and then assembling that. Yeah. Now, is, yeah. There, is there like a, a possibility where if a, like multiple people are going after the same keywords, but they're all using topic that you end up with a front page of like almost the same article, just different wording of all the same article? Yeah, I think that in terms of that question, which we do get a lot, um, <laughs> is the the idea is that um, you know, topic is helping you uh, do the um, helping you get to the point where you're as good as everyone else, and then it's up to you to do the critical thinking involved to add even more value. Mm -hmm. So you know, figuring out what unique angle could you provide? Do you have access to a data set that nobody else has, or do you have um, you know, do you have the uh, UX ability to create a really beautiful experience for your readers? Those are the kinds of things that really, I think, take content to the next level once you've reached that level of comprehensiveness. Mm. Yeah. Wow. This, this is such a cool concept. And I wonder what copywriters feel like right now <laughs> listening well, I mean, to this. <laughs> I, I don't think this will eliminate the need no, for copywriters because no, like you said, this is the, writing the rough draft. You still need somebody yeah. to go in and polish it up. And exactly. If you're trying to write a persuasive piece, they still need to add the persuasive elements. And all but that it's that first stuff. draft and we know how hard... I mean, we've been writing a lot more copy <laughs> than normal lately, it feels yeah. like. Uh, like email copy, all that sales page copy and like, yeah, having that first draft... Just think about the mental load uh, mm -hmm. that take, takes off your... That's the hardest part. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's just worth it right there alone <laughs> to get the ball. You have some motion now. So Yeah. Um, I think these in the next coming um, months and years, we'll see more systems where you'll have mm. uh, a really tight feedback loop between the AI and humans, you know, at each step of the way, creating little pieces of content until you get to something really polished. I think finding that balance between the two is really going to be... Um, the the tricky part 
you know, because you don't yeah. want the system to be entirely in charge. Yeah. Well, you're yeah. already seeing better and better AI in the form of like chat bots and things where it's harder and harder to tell if you're talking to a bot or a human. Mm. So I imagine it's sort of the same sort of technology and concepts applied behind the scenes is what you're seeing there. Um, and that seems to be evolving pretty quickly. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Nick, did you have something? Yeah. Yeah, one thing um, I think immediate um, benefits of using AI in your copywriting is, uh, especially if you have a ton of product pages where you need to come up with titles and descriptions, mm. I think AI is going to do a decent job there. Um, if you're looking for social media posting, like even though we don't, you know, we don't want AI to do that, we want humans to do it. Um, mm -hmm. It might be capable of, um, you know, coming up with um, social media messages, short form content. I think long form content, we still need human intervention because there's a lot of story backstory there's a lot of uh, you know voice and whatnot uh, i think that's going to evolve uh, but i think these are some areas where ai could e immediately benefit um, yeah oh my god yeah i could it makes a lot of sense with the short copy because you're mixing in things like keywords and probably um you know uh, qualities or aspects of that thing based off of data you know people buying or searching for things um, exactly. You, you mentioned the tight feedback loop. I was thinking, I'm like, man, it'd be so cool to get like almost immediate feedback, you know, tied, uh, I don't know, a, a page or elements to a conversion. And then you can like edit split tests and stuff in the fly on the same place in the copy. Well, you can already do that right now with tools like VWO and stuff like right. that, right? Yeah. But I'm saying like kind of tied in all together. So, you know, it kind of, I don't know, like having that dynamic changing copy based off it's just of like one. constantly optimizing itself right. as new viewers see it <laughs> it's almost like an input from what the demand in seo and what yeah. like the keyword and then like comprehensive content with uh uh so nobody nobody's ever reading the exact same article everybody's exactly. reading a slightly different article <laughs> because google's looking at the bounce rate of an article and going okay this person didn't bounce so quick so these words must be good but when we ran this version they bounced quickly so scrap those words <laughs> well it's dynamic everything right it's like yeah. pricing on amazon we we're just having a podcast about this earlier it's like yeah, you know, our airline pricing no one pays the same price twice it's it's all always fluctuating so yeah maybe content can be like that interesting content. <laughs> it could be tricky with google google doesn't like your content to constantly change uh, now does google case. does google mind it getting like updated like if you're adding stuff to the end or do they they don't like to see any change to existing sort of established content I think the core content that uh, is answering the user's questions and that Google is recognizing shouldn't change dy dynamically at a very faster pace, but there's still like user generated content that keeps changing, uh, right. which Google probably recognizes and is okay. But if you're changing long form content based on the persona, like people yeah. were landing on the page, it could be a little tricky. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's something that we wouldn't recommend. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll, when I'll, just also, how would it. Google know to rank it if like the keyword density of exactly. certain words are constantly Changes. fluctuated? Yeah, it wouldn't, it'd yeah. be hard for their algorithms to even handle it. But so maybe it's more of a sales page copy changing yeah. tied in with I that, think, but based, yeah. I think personalized onboarding or personalized uh, right. lead, uh, like, Tar ad targeting and then kind of um, creating that perfect landing page based on the persona. Yeah. Yeah. Where something uh, would be super beneficial. Yeah. I mean, we're already seeing it quite a bit in like Google AdWords. They now have like dynamic ads where you can plug in like five different headlines for your Google ads and it'll just constantly swap all the possible variations and eventually land on the one that per performs the best. Well, you could use topic for that then. There you go. You know, for whatever <laughs> keyword that the ad, I'm just thinking of like, that's a use case right there. They could write all the titles and descriptions right for all the ads on google yeah but what you write for your title isn't necessarily the keyword you're yeah, going after I guess but so. yeah yeah there's probably something there <laughs> maybe i don't know <laughs> they're thinking of all these other creative ways <laughs> i don't know ai and copy it just seems like it's it's cool like it's not something to fear but it's something that gives you a great foundation that's data driven yeah but also then you can add persuasion or you know modify stuff yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely i think Go ahead. Like people are going to be working um, at the level of ideas rather than sentences. Sure. You know, mm -hmm. people are going to be spending more time thinking about how these ideas flow together and the message they want to uh, share. And in the end, that's going to result in higher quality content for all sorts of different, you know, searches. And so it's going to be beneficial for everybody mm -hmm. um, and still require human intervention. Yeah. So what do you, what do you think is like the future of like AI in regards to SEO specifically? I mean, we've talked about like AI in, in, in the content and actually creating the content, but how do you, how do you see it sort of 
um, impacting SEO? And because you mentioned earlier on a, working with AI through SEO, is when you were saying that, were you talking about specifically more the copywriting, or is there other AI implications with SEO? Yeah, I mean, I feel like there are certainly AI implications for SEO in terms of Google's ability to match content to the user's search intent. Mm -hmm. You know, people are already used to not only being able to see the right page that they're searching for, but also like the right sentence within the page. And mm -hmm. that's that requires a, a pretty detailed understanding of what that sentence means and, um, you know, what the user wants to do. But I think in terms of um, the future of AI and SEO, one interesting thing is that um, the, the, the biggest buzz around AI is currently centered around GPT-3, um, which is open AI's uh, model that mm -hmm. um, they're starting to commercialize mm -hmm. and get everybody to use. But uh, in their terms of service, they mention that uh, generating... Uh, SEO copy in mass is not allowed mm -hmm. um, according to their terms of service and they'll shut you down if they notice you doing that, which is really interesting because at that point, you know, it's sort of saying that the technology is capable of doing that. It's just that doing that would probably harm the internet because you'd get a lot of spam and mm -hmm. it would confuse Google and you'd start to see, you know, bad results come up. And so, um, yeah, I think there's, there's a mix between what technology is capable of and what humans and what people think would be best for everyone involved. Mm. Yeah. Man, that's, that could be a loaded topic right there too. <laughs> you can go all the way to like, look what Elon's doing right now with Neuralink and they, they goes all into, I'm just thinking like the implications of AI, you know, like how far do you go with it? Yeah. Um, compared to like you were saying with kind of like uh, the human intervention side. When it comes yeah, to it definitely it definitely ties in because it's like some of the other cases are you know like um, posting on social without a human involved or mm -hmm. uh, you know all sorts of things that can be used to manipulate people and it definitely ties in. Yeah, and fake yeah. news is it's also going to be problematic if you guys generating fake news. So right, yeah, definitely there's a lot of regulations that need to be involved. Well, just imagine how good it probably already is at uh, creating clickbait headlines, right? Like. <laughs> It's already happening. So yeah, it's like I mean, the AI already come, knows yeah. how to create the clickbait headlines that everybody wants to click on, and if they start tying that together with like fake news, yeah, right. it's, it's sort of like a recipe for for disaster there. <laughs> well, then you have. Yeah, I think op o Open AI is actually um, Elon's investment. It? Like, yeah, it's it's funded by it's founded by Elon Musk, just to prevent uh, to have more regulations uh, in AI space. I think that's the main vision that they're going after mm -hmm. to create a safe space for AI to ex coexist with humans. Uh, but that's the mission that they're going after. That's it's to not let AI, you know, uh, not yeah. let AI do manipulate, uh, human emotions. It is interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> I used to use Twitter a lot and then I stopped for several years and actually I'm a fan of Twitter once again, yeah. but the reason I stopped using Twitter for like several years was it got to a point where it just felt like Twitter was a whole bunch of bots chatting at other bots right like everybody was using it to like R as like a secondary rss feed for their blog post and their podcasts and then you had all these other social media tools that would automatically share stuff for you and it mm. it just felt like it turned into this like bots talking to bots and i think that's sort of the potential rabbit hole you go down with social media and ai right is it it turns into a place where there's actually nobody really being social on social media anymore it's just <laughs> bots talking to each other and then another bot giving a fire <laughs> you know flex emoji <laughs> below it and uh it that's happens. what social media because uh could become well some of them already become that but <laughs> well yeah instagram i mean that's yeah you describe twitter almost like what happened there moved to instagram yeah <laughs> you know with instagram bots. no instagram like all the comments are fake right it's just like a fire emoji and a flex emoji and it's just like bots commenting on everybody for them <laughs> and uh i think that's my concern with the the whole ai and social media is like we got to figure out how to sort of keep that stuff at bay so that people are still communicating with each other yeah, definitely. It's like all about, uh, you know, the signals involved on social media. It's all about mm -hmm. engagement, you know, through likes or, you know, somehow signifying that this is something or reshares. And so luckily on the SEO side, um, it's, it's a little more uh, tied to the value of the content. You know, if you're writing a recipe, if you're writing a recipe for search and you write it to infuriate the user, you know, you're not necessarily going to have them spend more time on the site. They're going to bounce mm -hmm. out. But if the recipe site that actually creates content with like a, a really tasty, healthy recipe, then, you know, people are going to spend more time on it. It's more valuable. So luckily the signals are more in, um, 
more in search's favor than on social. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Sort of self-regulates itself. Were you going to say? Kinda, no, I was just thinking. Yeah. There's, <laughs> it's just interesting all the different inputs that are, that are in there. Uh, I mean, that's like, like you said, it's uh, on the social, it's all engagements. I mean, a lot of the metrics are based off of that. And I don't know, it's like, it's always changing too. And I guess that explains why Google's always changing, why social media algorithms have to always change because there's, I guess, AI or some input or someone's found a loophole to kind of push things in their favor a little bit. I mean, is that kind of true? I don't know. Um, <laughs> because it's- I think that's really, that's that's true. I think even with Instagram, um, at the very beginning, people were utilizing their fake followers to mm-hmm. get more, you know, traction, get their posts bubbled up, but Instagram's cracking down on that. Same with Google. The very beginning at the you know, inception of SEO, people were just stuffing keywords in to have mm-hmm. their article show up. But then Google started getting smarter and smarter. And um, I think that's eventually going to happen with any platform. Initially, you'll have loopholes that people would, uh, you know, make uh, use of. But then the platform's going to come cracking it down because it's not in the long-term in- interest of the platform and its users. Yeah, yeah, makes total sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so coming back to to the SEO topic, is there any other sort of um, best practices or or sort of things that we can talk about to really help people? improve their SEO on their, their website. I mean, we, we know what use topic does, right. Or uh, topic, the, the website to use topic.com. Right. Um, so topic, you, you plug in an article or a keyword, it gives you this brief and it tells you, this is the type of content you should be posting about. This is what you should be writing about. Um, outside of that, are you seeing any other like creative, unique ways that people are, are impacting their SEO? I think one thing that was mentioned previously um, that should be highlighted again is that oftentimes re-optimizing your existing library can make a bigger difference than creating new content. Mm. And that's often a gold mine. Mm-hmm. When we meet new companies and they tell us, oh, we spent like we spent so much money creating this library and now we want to figure out how to create a second version of our library. It's like know. You know, <laughs> let's let's dig into what worked previously and and amplify that. So I think that's a, that's a treasure trove. I think another thing too is, um, you know, being able to, uh, being able to efficiently prioritize uh, what you're going to change, like the on-page optimizations Mm -hmm. based on what's going to impact the user rather than the latest shiny thing or what you read recently or heard in, um, heard in like a conference recently. Uh It's like, you know that thing that applies to things like page speed optimizations. You really have to take a step back and think. You know, is this going to be the, th- the the best value for me in terms of the effort that I'm spending versus the value my users get? Mm. No. So I'm thinking about it from that perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Makes yeah to sense. add on to what Rio mentioned, uh, uh, you know, being data driven about their SEO, especially when you already have a huge content library that you're working with. Uh, a lot of people underutilize Google Search Console. Oh. Uh, so Google Search Console actually has the high fidelity data of the queries that you're ranking for, the traffic that you're getting from Google. It's the, the best source of truth. Mm-hmm. And going into that uh, data set and sort of figuring out what topics are resonating with the users. Can I double down on that? Can I create more interesting pieces of content around that uh, would be a good place to start uh, instead of you know trying to go after uh, some new uh, domain or new topic that you're not really, uh, you know, authoritative in. So that's something that we have done personally at uh, our previous company and with consulting before we started Topic. Just going to Google Search Console, help them kind of create their content calendars based on the queries that you're showing up on, mm-hmm. uh, where you're not ranking high, but you're showing up for those. So uh, helping them create those missing pieces really kind of boosted the traffic numbers as well. Yeah, that's that so sense. smart to start. I like that you called it the source, the one source of truth, or the <laughs> best source of truth. <laughs> it's like from Google's data. Yeah, they don't always give you the best stuff, but Search Console, I guess, is even better than analytics and all that stuff. In your perspective, exactly. Yeah, I think Search Console has interesting data, like click through rates, um, which is uh, interesting because uh, uh, impressions is only one metric that. Is only like the tools like uh, you know Moz or SEMrush or Ahrefs. Mm-hmm. They give you the click through rate and approximate um, impressions that your keywords getting, but the actual source of truth, like how much act- are you actually getting, is what you find in Google Search Console. Mm-hmm. Now, w- when it comes to um, 
deciding what keywords to go after. Let's say that I want to go create a content brief. I haven't written a piece of content on it. I, I want to write a new piece of content. Um, where do you guys go to determine which keyword to create a brief on and, and to, and to, to get going? Like, do, do you guys have a process to decide like, okay, this, this is the next keyword. Let's, let's assume that my site's not getting a lot of Google love. I don't have existing keywords that are ranking real well yet. How am I going to go pick out a keyword to start with? I think the best place to uh, start is do a keyword research project where you kind of identify keywords that you want to go after or topics that you want to cover from that, you know, use tools like Ahrefs, uh, which is awesome. We love it <laughs> at uh, topic. Uh, yeah. Use Ahrefs or other SEO tools to kind of figure out like actual subtopics that you need to cover under mm. that umbrella topic. And then from there, you plug in those keywords in the topic, generate outlines and hand it off to your writer. So, it has to be done as a process. It's not, it shouldn't be done ad hoc. So you need to do your keyword research and come up with at least a month, a, a quarter's worth, worth, worth of work mm-hmm. uh, and then execute on that instead of ad hoc searching for a keyword and then generating a brief. So we, we advise people to do it in bulk. That's yeah, and I think that, yeah. <laughs> that ties in with you know, competitive analysis, figuring out who's in the market, who's really succeeding, how they're doing it. Um, one thing is that for people who are just starting out, oftentimes the first instinct is to go out and try to create content because mm-hmm. that's all they hear. But mm-hmm. really, we usually recommend focusing on authority first until you have a certain baseline of authority. You know, in Ahrefs, I've seen that you know roughly like a domain rating of like thirty to forty is when you can start ranking for uh, long tail keywords. Mm. So if you're just starting out from scratch, it's it's a bit of a um, it's an inefficient use of your time to create content. At that point, you should be thinking of how to get backlinks, um, how to, uh, you know, generate some authority. Hmm. Yeah. Makes sense. Now, for backlinks, then, uh, uh, you know, you guys described you had the tool where it's embeddable, uh, so that generated a lot of backlinks. Like, what are some other good ways that you recommend that folks can use to get backlinks at these early stages? Yeah, I think. Yeah. One, or go ahead, Nick. Uh, sorry. Both <laughs> sorry, of you. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I think one way that we're doing it is, um, and we recommend other people as well, is to kind of figure out some free tools that you can offer to your audience. So we've launched two free tools that um, has been getting good traction by the community. uh, And that's a great way to build backlinks. The other way is to create really good pillar pillar pieces of content, like really good quality pieces that are data driven. Uh, if you have a unique set of data that you're working with, and then reach out to big publications to kind of mm. share that, um, you know, mm. that blog or embed it in your, uh, like, uh, add a link um, in their blog. Kind of like so the, that's, the skyscraper. The skyscraper. Yeah. We actually had, we yeah. had Brian Dean on the mm-hmm. show maybe a year oh, ago. Wow, and awesome. I think he walked through that whole process. He did. Yeah, that's smart. And then you layer in PR, you know, you get. Uh, you know, you, you share amplify that it. Yeah, just amplify it and then you start yeah, getting the link backs and cross link, all that. Exactly. And it has to be very organic. It shouldn't be you shouldn't be trying to gamify or, you know, uh, Google. You should mm-hmm. make a uh, it should be very organic. People need to start talking about your brand because they love your brand. And mm-hmm. you can't force people to talk about your brand. So that's some of the suggestions I have. Um really do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think for this question. Uh, one thing that can be useful is thinking about um, your own unique strengths. You know, we mentioned the tools because we're both engineers. So mm-hmm. It's very affordable for us from a time perspective to create a, a specially valuable tool. But, um, you know, what are the unique angles? Like uh, one common uh, angle is if you run uh, some sort of marketplace, you can feature your vendors. Mm-hmm. And so that feature helps your vendors, but also you can encourage them to put a badge on their site. Uh, Yep. But there's all sorts of different techniques like that. And looking at your competitors can actually help um, inspire you because you can see how they're getting their, their backlinks, um, both organically and through a planned fashion. You know, mm-hmm. are they ex- What kind of backlink campaigns are they executing and who are they reaching out to get them? And yeah. Ahrefs can give you that kind of data. Uh, yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's, I mean, another guess you know backlinking strategies go on other people's podcasts Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know that's something obviously you guys are doing right now so you'll get links back and all that but yeah no it's interesting at the early stages like that's a good thing to focus on Mm -hmm. yeah when you don't have that domain authority 
Yeah, a lot of hustle. Uh huh. <laughs> that's, that's how I would describe it. A lot of hustle. Things yeah. that don't scale, you got to do it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, what else? Uh, what do we have? I mean, is there anything else on SEO that you wanted to touch on, Matt? I, I know. I think we covered a lot of ground. We I did. Mean, <laughs> um, I, I think we should we should sort of wrap up just sort of talking a little bit more about topic and um. Well, well, first of all, why don't you tell people where they can go learn more about topic and and grab it and yeah. and all that good stuff. Yeah. So if you're interested in topic, if you're interested in improving your content, uh, you can check it out at usetopic.com. Um, and that's our Sweet. URL. Cool. Right on. Yeah. yeah. No, we, we use it. We love it. And I think what well, it's, it seems like it's going to just keep building, building into, you know, more of the AI and all these other signals out there that just going to yeah. help you. And I mean, I think, I think we signed up like two months ago and I think just mm-hmm. in the last two months, a whole bunch of new things have rolled out. Like after I signed up, there was like a, a Google Docs functionality where basically you can just type your stuff in Google nice. Docs and it'll pull in like the suggestions right into Google Docs for you. And you guys just mentioned that it'll help with your subject line and description now. And it's like, it, so you guys <laughs> seem to be constantly improving it and, you know, innovating in, in that area. So um, pretty yeah. exciting stuff. Any any other stuff that's in the works that you're excited that, that might roll into topic in the future that you could talk about? I think one area is uh, summarization. So these AI systems are also really great at taking really long pieces of text and then distilling them down into their meaning. I think that that has huge implications for enhancing the research process. Mm-hmm. So that's an area that we're going to be focusing on, focusing in on to, to make that even faster. That sounds so freaking, yeah. I'm just thinking of like, wow, yeah. Uh, you know, those book summary sites. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's like you can kind of summarize, a, you know, any or big long post. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. I like that. Yeah. Even for podcast research, that would help us a lot. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anything else yeah, on your side there? Yeah, so there's one other feature that we are planning to roll out in the couple, next couple of months is to help you identify those low-hanging fruits in your content library hmm. that you can immediately optimize. Uh, right now, people have to do it offline in Google Sheets. Uh, we're trying to bring that uh, using our AI technology, sort of help you identify those thin pages of content that could you know, get some love. Uh, okay. So that's the next uh, one of the features that we have in the pipeline as well. Very cool. Wait. Um, well, shoot. I think you're in like an exciting space at the right time. Uh, like with AI and all that stuff is is really like to sum everything up with what you guys are doing. Like, how does the future look like? Obviously, topic is is part of the journey now, but is it always like AI somehow wrapped around there and uh, and maybe content? Because it seems like it's always. So are you content. asking like what future tools Kinda might like they what, develop? Well, what fu- what's like what's interesting on the horizon? I guess like even further outside of like you know with how you see this all kind of headed i think in the in the further out future you know i think the research process is going to be as polished as the consumption process you know like i mentioned earlier you search for a term and google's so good at giving you the right answer Mm -hmm. it's going to be the same way on the other end for the person producing the content you're going to be trying to come up with something and the system's going to be so good at giving you the information that you need yeah. to synthesize that right and, and most of the yeah. time you don't even need to click into the website anymore google just puts it right there which is a whole nother rabbit hole that i don't know if we want to mm. go in but like you know there's that of, whole yeah. implication of like will people still be clicking away from google in the future or is google just going to pull mm. all the content to the front page and say here's what you were looking for but i don't know uh maybe what are your quick thoughts on that <laughs> but i don't i don't want to go too deep <laughs> yeah i mean oh go ahead nick <laughs> uh, i for me personally, uh, if a user wants to get a quick answer, then Google should do it. Like, mm-hmm. for example, if you're trying to run a calculation and you have to go onto this website and you know run it, it's, mm-hmm. it's not going to be uh, conducive to the user. That's mm-hmm. why Google shows that, you know, when you type in a math number or equation, it shows you the answer in, the, in Google search itself. Mm-hmm. Same with uh, flight details or any other information. So anything that can be quickly, ac- should be quickly accessible to the users Google will end up showing that in the search result itself. But anything that's more informative, um, I don't think Google is going to replace. Uh, you know, you s- people have will still click into those pages and read content in depth if if it has if it isn't, if it's informative. But mm-hmm. that's yeah. my take on it. That makes sense. Yeah, but it's uh, yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. I guess it's utilities if they can just get it done in a quick utility fashion, like a calculator exactly. or like converter. You know, you see a lot of those embedded on on uh, Google. Yeah. But um 
Yeah. No, that's yeah. It's interesting to hear your perspective from being a developer and engineers. We don't chat with many, and then how it affects marketing. Yeah, I think that's kind of cool. <laughs> so cool. I think that's it. Yeah. So use topic dot com. Go grab it. And uh, guys, it's been fun. Thank you. Sounds good. Thanks for having us on. And yeah, thanks welcome. for having us on. Hey, hey, hey! Thank you for listening to that episode. This is Joe Fear. I'm sure you probably already knew that. And Matt is not here right now, but I'm pretty sure he enjoyed the episode just as much as you and I did because, you know, he went into the production of kind of making that thing right along with me. So thank you very much. And I want to give a quick shout out to our buddies over at Easy Webinar. These guys have been supporting us for a while, a long time. And Casey Zeman is just a super good guy all around. He's actually been on the show before. He's the founder of uh, Easy Webinar. So if you look up Casey Zeman on any podcast platform you're listening to, uh, go check him out. Go check out his backstory, what he's all about. You can learn a lot about webinars as well. And right now, you know, Easy Webinar, these guys are actually hooking you up with a great trial. It's a completely free trial to test out their software, soup to nuts, check it all out and see if it's a good fit for you. If you go to easywebinar.com slash hustle, that's H-U-S-T-L-E, if you didn't know how to spell hustle, there you go. So if you go to easywebinar.com slash hustle, you can go grab a free trial. And Easy Webinar literally lives up to its name. It's super simple. I mean, super easy. And it does all the stuff that you're looking for in any kind of thing with webinars. I mean, they literally cover every single type of webinar you possibly can do. So from live to automated to scheduled at specific times and all these crazy features in between, can't even list them all out. I'll be here way too long. They give you a ton of advanced analytics, what's working, what's not during your webinar based off all these actions. You'll see who attended, how long they stayed, if they clicked the offer or if they didn't. Basically, you're going to make more money and you're going to work less with this thing and you're going to create better relationships with the folks that are listening because it's a good experience. You want to give that good experience along with some great content, of course, in a killer offer if that's what you got for them. So go try it out yourself. Go check out easywebinar.com slash hustle. That's easywebinar.com slash hustle. All right, all righty. So that is the end of this episode. Thank you so much for listening to this episode, enjoying it. Hopefully you did. I'm pretty sure you did if you lasted this long. And go check out Easy Webinar when you get the chance. And we will talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of the Hustle and Flowchart podcast. For taking the time to listen, we want to give you something a little bit special. Every single episode that we do, we actually have somebody on our team take notes. We basically have a Cliff's Notes version of every episode where you can go and find all of the tips and tactics that they laid out, all of the resources that they laid out all the good stuff from this episode we actually have a nice simple notes version that you can find on our website so go to evergreenprofits.com find this episode that you just listened to and uh, give us your email address and we'll send you the notes thanks for listening